Hi, well, welcome everybody to the August 2024 meetup of the uh, National Power Group. Uh, so I think we've got a great session for everybody today. We've got uh, you know some uh, some updates from uh, Power BI, a little bit about some of the conferences that are coming up, and then we've got a great session from uh, Jason Romans all about how to uh, improve your report performance and really I think improve your uh, your development uh, game with uh, with some external tools, uh, particularly DAX Studio and Tag Editor. I've seen Jason uh, present on things in the past. He's a he's a he's a really knowledgeable subject. I mean, really one of the one of the most knowledgeable people that I personally know on the subject of uh, of uh, Vertipack and and uh, tabular models. So I'm super excited to hear how how he's using those tools in in his uh, day to day. So uh, let me share my screen, and we can get started. Welcome everybody. So, uh, so like I say, so the, the agenda for today, we're going to go over some announcements, some some what's new in the various uh, Microsoft uh, tool sets that we use, uh, and uh, and we've got a main presentation uh, from Jason Romans, uh, power up your fabric development with uh, DAX Studio and Tabular Editor. So uh, we want to just, just uh, talk about some of the uh, some of the upcoming meetings, both for the na uh, National User Group uh, as well as some other meetings uh, around the area. So we've got a, a, a meetup for, with uh, Christina Ferris in on real time analytics and fabric. This is actually our November meetup, um, and so that's the usual uh, time, eleven thirty to one on the twenty first of November. That's uh, one week before Thanksgiving. Uh, so, um, so um, uh, that'll be a really uh, interesting conversation on how to use uh, Fabric for uh, for real time uh, streaming analytics. So that'll be fun. Uh, we don't yet have a presentation for September or October that that are that's locked in. So, uh, you know, we definitely are interested in, in getting some more speakers to talk about fascinating uh, things. Um, you know, we, we definitely have a have a great uh, uh, user community here with, uh, with with lots of expertise. We want to be able to share some of that and let you guys talk, uh, hear from people besides just uh, just me and and Michael and and Seiko. Uh, and uh, so we'd love to hear from you guys if you have topics. Uh, definitely reach out to any of us and uh, let us know. So some of the uh, data uh, oriented uh, community sessions that are coming up, uh, actually Jason Romans, our presenter today, is going to be speaking at this session uh, on Saturday. Uh, so this is Data Saturday Columbus, uh, this Saturday uh, in Westerville, Ohio. Uh, so it's, it's uh, basically free, except uh, you know, there's a small fee for, uh, for lunch. These sessions are, are, are uh, really fast. And this is kind of, I, I mean, I think it's fair to say this is sort of an, an outgrowth of, um, of of SQL Saturdays. You know, SQL Saturday kind of took a dip for a while uh, in COVID, and this kind of spring up uh, sort of out of uh, out of that. But actually, SQL Saturday is making a bit of a resurgence, uh, and so so these are some of the SQL Saturdays uh, in North America, and a few of those uh, last two there are actually in Brazil and Peru. Uh, but uh, lots of SQL Saturday sessions that are coming up, so I'm excited to see that those are uh, coming back in. Uh, in force. So if any one of those is near you or interesting to you, uh, definitely check those out. I think Jason actually presented at one of those uh, this past weekend. Is that right, Jason? Did Albany, what was it, two weeks ago? Two weeks ago? Okay, cool. I'm losing track of uh, time. Yeah. Are, you, are you going to any of these other sessions uh, coming up? San Diego, Minnesota, Orlando, have not heard anything from Toronto yet, and then have not heard from Oregon yet. Well, well the Oregon one would definitely be fun. The uh, Pacific Northwest is a beautiful uh, part of the country. Um, all right. So then there's also a little bit more local. There's also the uh, this used to be the National Analytics Summit. They they've rebranded this to the National Innovation Summit. Uh, and uh, I beg your pardon, sorry. I, I um. I didn't uh, get the location updated. That is not in Memphis. That is here, here uh, in Nashville, uh, Tennessee. It's going to be September 30th and October 1st uh, of this year. And the registration is open now at nationalinnovationsummit.com. Uh, and then 
Um, there's also the Power Platform Community Conference uh, that is uh, that's coming up um, September 18th, 19th, and 20th uh, at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. This is kind of one of their big conferences uh, that Microsoft puts on all year, uh, and I'm sure that there'll be a, just a ton of things there. There's also uh, pre and post uh, conference workshops on the 16th, 17th, and 21st uh, of, uh, sep uh, of September. I've also got a um, a mock letter that you can send your boss to try to help them um, to try to help you convince your boss to fund sending you uh, to to this conference. So if that's something that would be interesting, you can go to that website there. Uh, and then there's also um, uh, Memphis Microsoft Community Days is coming up uh, October 3rd and 4th. I'm actually going to be uh, presenting uh, at this session, so I hope you'll definitely come come join me uh, for that. Um, then uh, the last thing that I will mention is Past Community Summit, which you know is definitely one of the bigger conferences uh, for the years coming up, November fourth through the uh, to the eighth of this year uh, in Seattle. So definitely one uh, one not to miss. Uh, I, I, I say, I know has separately presented that uh, at that session conference um, in in the past. So um, if there's any one conference that I would go to, I think this would be be the one. Uh, all right, so I just want to talk about some of the things that are that's new in in Power BI. I do have a few um, a few demos or just a couple of demos uh, here that I'll be going uh, over. And um, so the the big ones that I want to talk about uh, actually are the the general availability of the enhanced role of security editor in Power BI Desktop and DAX query for um, DAX query view in Live Connect. And I think that these are both really interesting. Um, the, the DAX query view, what they're doing is they're kind of supplementing some of the functionality that you've only really been able to get in, in DAX Studio. So, you know, this is not going to replace DAX Studio, certainly not yet anyways. Uh, so uh, the this, this stuff that Jason's going to talk about is going to be still super, super valuable. Um, I think they're, they're just kind of, they're just, trying to give you one more place that you can accomplish the same thing. Everything that you can do in DAX Query View, you can do in, in DAX Studio, I, I believe, uh, and certainly a great deal more as well you can do in DAX Studio. But I think the DAX Query View is it's, it's interesting in that it's it's kind of right there. So that, that's a nice functionality. So I just want to, um, to, to demonstrate to, that to you guys. So um, I'm going to, uh, so let me do that demo now. I've got a um, a report up here, and this this visual. I apologize. This is a an Azure Maps visual, and this was literally working until I after I got on the call, and uh, the darn thing broke. So I apologize. But I'm just going to move off of this screen here. It's not really important which screen that we're showing. Um, but so I, I wanted to introduce the the general the generally available um, rollup security. Uh, interface. This has been around in preview for a little while, uh, but since it's GA, I wanted to just um, give you guys a quick demo of this. So if you go to the modeling ribbon and you, you click on manage roles, this is how you create and edit uh, your, uh, your role of security uh, groupings. And so we're going to create a new role. And so you can rename this and click the ellipsis to rename it, or uh, you can also duplicate or delete, but you can also just double click on this to rename it. And so I am going to rename this to Australia. And so uh, you can click on any one of these tables here. I'm going to go to geography. We're going to insert a new row here. And I want to filter this geography table based on the country column where it equals Australia. So the way that rule of security works is it basically enforces a particular filter context, right? And so anyone who does not have sufficient workspace permissions will be will only see the data that they're allowed to see based on the rule of security policies that are in place. So, you know, so if you are like an admin for the workspace to which you publish this content, you're going to be able to see everything. 
But if you're given permission to view this report through an app, for example, you're only going to see the rows for which you have uh, permission via the role of security groups that you find yourself in. So what you do is you create one or more of these role of security groups that have some filter context in it. You save and publish this report to the Power BI service, and then that filter context is then enforced. So, um, so I'll, I'll explain that in just a bit more in just one second, but I just want to demonstrate that you've also got this uh, DAX editor, so you can actually switch this uh, to a very traditional DAX editor view. Uh, we can even add uh, elements here, so I can say and uh, city, for example, you see it's got IntelliSensed uh, here, and city um, equals, um, actually, sorry, I think, let me say state, state uh, equals uh, Victoria. And you can um, uh, verify this uh, DAX expression. You can switch back and forth between the two. You'll see that it just simply gives me a second line here. And so this is going to pass in the filter context the dual filter context of country equals Australia, state equals Victoria. And so if I save this and then we take a look at the uh, at the data model. So this this geography table here has a one to many relationship with the sales table via the zip and country column. And so what it's going to do is it's going to pass in that the, the filter context for country equals Australia, city equals a state equals Victoria, and it's going to pass in those zip codes for which both of those things are true. And anyone who is in that role of security grouping will only uh, be able to see those records uh, where that filter context uh, is satisfied. So um, that's been around in, in preview for a little while, but uh, since it's GI, I wanted to, wanted, wanted to show that to you guys. So the other thing I wanted to show was the DAX query view uh, in a like connection. So I've just got a blank file here, and I'm going to go to our One Lake Data Hub, and I'm going to click on Power BI Semantic Models. This is going to bring up a dialog box here that's going to list uh, all my semantic models that I have, and I am going to say uh, dashboard today here, and we'll connect to that. So now we've got a live connection to our dashboard today data set. You'll see our tables here on the left in just a moment. Now you'll notice that we did lose our table view, right? So you can't look at the actual data that's in the tables when you're live connected to a data set. This, this new DAX uh, query view that came up um, is an interesting workaround to, to that. So you, we can go to the model view, we can see um, the, the tables that we're working with here. Uh, they have been sort of rearranged. You can you can move them back to whatever orientation that you want. You know, the, the layout doesn't really matter to the actual functionality. But so if we come to the query, uh, the DAX query view here, so um, you so you can uh, write uh, you can write DAX queries here. Um, uh, this is again something that you've been able to do for a little while with with models that are in the file that you're working with, but you've not been able to do that for for live queries. One nice thing that you can do here is I can say, for example, evaluate sales. And whereas you cannot see the data in the sales table, this is actually one way for me to be able to see uh, the, the data in the sales table. The other thing I can do is I can say top in uh, 100, for example, and I can just uh, take a look at the at the top 100 rows for the, of the sales table, uh, for example. You can also um, right click and go to quick uh, quick queries and you can say uh, show column statistics and this will render uh, some of the column statistics counts uh, how many distinct values there are min max uh, for date ranges will give you the lowest and highest date uh, averages medians for numerical columns uh, so on and so forth so this just gives you some nice statistics uh, for your data set uh, so for example if we were to do this for sales it's going to have some more numerical columns and these uh, a few more of these uh, columns here would light up for that so it's just a really nice way, even if you don't have the model open on your desktop an, and you have a live connection to that model, it's just a nice way to be able to explore that data within Power BI Desktop just to get a feel for some of the data that's in here, some of the statistical ranges uh, for the data, get a you know a sense of you know the top 100 rows or or even the entire data set if you like. So those are some of the um, some of the some of the things that you can do with the DAX query view uh, in a uh, live connection.
Let me. Sorry, one second. All right, so um, the July uh, YouTube video and the blog post are all out. Uh, you guys can check that out for um, for the, the rest of it. It's all uh, it's all you know fairly self-explanatory, uh, but um, but those those are the two that uh, I found most interesting this month. There are uh, some updates for Excel. Um, they're they're definitely pushing uh, Copilot. So if you have access to Copilot, uh, it uh, th that's some that's big in both Excel for web, Excel for Windows, and even Excel um, and the Mac. Um, I, there was a new function that was in Excel for Windows and Excel for Mac that I thought was kind of interesting. You can pass in uh, various uh, text and you can have it uh, detect a language. You can have it translate. Uh, you could even, if you, if you, when you use translate, you have to pass in the text, but also the the sourced language. So what what language the text is in currently, and what language you want to. Uh, you want it to translate into, and so you can use the detect language if you're not sure what, what language something is, and it'll it'll uh, it'll take its best guess. Um, they, they've added a uh, Python editor in Excel for Windows. I'm not um, not really big on on Python. I mean, nothing against Python. I just don't happen to. I'm not very familiar with it, so I uh, I can't demo that. But uh, glad to see that they're adding that to, into Excel, and they're very slowly making some small improvements say, in Power Query. For the Mac, I just making that a little bit more uh, accessible. So glad to see that. Um, there's some small updates for uh, for Power Automate desktop. Um, so if you guys are using any any robotic process automation in the RPA, they've got some some new small functionalities uh, for that. So they got some new Excel um, actions uh, that have been added and a few other uh, small pieces. Uh, and then they they built out on that Excel functionality in the uh, July update. All right, so those are all the updates for uh, for Power BI, for the Power Platform, for Excel for this month. Um, so I'm really excited to hear about uh, the DAX Studio the Tagware Editor, especially from somebody um, who who is. Um, I, I, Jason, is, is it fair to say that you're sort of a, a, a Tagware developer first? Is in, uh, is that is that I mean, I sort of feel like that's kind of, you, you know, like, like you, you. I would. That's kind of your your driving passion in Power BI. No. Yes, because I started on SQL Server Analysis Services, so yeah. the only tool we had was Visual Studio, and so that's why right. I started using Tabular Editor. And then one of my models, that's the only way it was built, is Tabular Editor, wasn't using Power BI. Right. Well, uh, I'm really excited to hear how you how you're using both of these uh, both of these tools and um, and I you know Jason I, I don't I don't want to throw you for for a loop but what, one of the things I would personally love to see is um, how you can add uh, an entire new table uh, into a data set so I don't know that's something that you, you can you can show off uh, and I don't, want, I don't mean to uh, mess up your presentation but uh, um, I'd I'd be fascinated by that but anyway I'm going to turn this over to Jason. And uh, looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think what we'll do is I'll start with having me on camera also, and we'll see if that works out. And then someone can say like, no, that's not working. It's hard to see. Um, give me one second. Do you think that's going to block too much of the slides? Probably. Um, I think it's OK for now. Maybe we can try that and see. Let me try one more thing. Hold on. Yesterday, I actually had an option where I could select how big I was on the screen, but this time it's not letting me. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and just do the slide deck. See the slide okay? Yeah, perfect. All right, that's something for me to work on. So welcome everyone. Um, this is Power Up Your Fabric Development with DAX Studio and Tabular Editor. Um, I will say this session, this topic, kind of goes along with knowing that this is part of the certification 
So we'll have to see where Michael's request comes in. I've done other talks where I've just drilled down in Tabular Editor and doing things like adding tables or running scripts. So we'll have to see where that fits in today. So my name's Jason Romans. I'm a senior business intelligence engineer. I would like the title of builder of models because that's the part of Power BI of analysis services that I really like is the model itself. I am a fan of puns, so I started a blog called The Dak Shepherd. Obviously, there's an actor named Dak Shepherd spelled differently, but I also know that there's people that have shepherded me, have taught me about Dax, Power BI, data modeling, and I hope to teach others too. I live in Nashville, Tennessee with my wife. I started as a SQL Server DBA, and like all SQL Server DBAs, I was an accidental one. Um, they had an open position, I moved over. But what that did is that kind of exposed me to all our applications, the data, and then it was very organic. I started become friends with the FPNA group, the financial planning and analysis, and just talking to them, talking about what they do. They had a failed Cognos project. They had all these assets that were just sitting there that were ready to be used. And so I started learning about tabular and analysis services and how to do that. And I will say everyone is on a different part of their journey right now. I'm almost sure I went into one of the Italians, either Marco or Alberto session at PASS. And I think I walked out because I did not understand what they were talking about or how even to do this. Because remember at the time I was a SQL Server DBA. So I currently work on everything on the Microsoft stack. So I'm still pulling in data using integration services, landing it database, but I'm really hoping more and more of my time is going to be sent spent with Power BI, the data model, Fabric. I'm starting to get into notebooks and I'm loving it. So I am a simple talk author, which is hosted at Redgate. Um, this year I was made a community ambassador and I don't have all the details, but I did a podcast for them and it was released today. So I imagine that'll be on the Simple Talk website. And then my favorite data model I named TARDIS. And that's the name given on analysis services. So when you go to connect, you're connecting to TARDIS. And I still get joy that there's meeting invites and emails and company documentation talking about TARDIS and access to TARDIS and everything about TARDIS. Obviously, it's a reference to Doctor Who. And yes, the data model is bigger on the inside. So I do want to pause real quick and say, I'm only here, and I touched on this earlier, because of what others have done. Others have taught me. Others have you know, shared their knowledge, encouraged me to speak, encouraged me to do this. So I just want to take a moment. And I mean, there's too many people to name. And even groups like this, they're there so we can learn from each other. And like he said, if you're thinking about speaking, it's your opportunity at any point to say, I want to speak on this topic. Maybe it's even just, I want to do five minutes on this topic. In fact, the Nashville Excel group I did a book review and that's really the first time I presented was doing a book review. So our journey today, we'll have an intro. We'll look at Performance Analyzer. We'll look at DAX Studio. We'll look at Tabular Editor. And then lastly, we'll conclude. I just wanna point out, these are Nashville barbecue smokers. Like we're talking Martins, Edley's, Peg Leg Porker. These may look like Austin smokers, but they're not. Just saying. So intro. So the first thing I want to point out, because a lot of people hear about fabric, fabric, fabric. OK, does that mean I'm not going to do Power BI? Does that mean the skills I've learned aren't going to be needed anymore? And it's like, no, Power BI is part of fabric. You have a fabric capacity. All it does is allow you to do more. You get now one lake, a warehouse, 
and you even get a default semantic model. This also shows me that for Microsoft, that semantic model is a part, an integral part of Fabric. So things like AI, your Power BI, everything is going to depend on a good semantic model, one that's well built, one that can perform. So all these skills that I learned in analysis services are just transferring over. And what we cover today applies to Power BI Pro, Power BI Premium, and Fabric. The only thing where, and we don't really cover a lot of this today, is if you want to actually connect external tools to Power BI Premium, then you are to Power BI in the service, then you may need a premium or a fabric capacity that Power BI Pro does not have that endpoint to connect to. So again, part of what initiated taking this of a collection of external tools and overview of those external tools and saying, okay, let's concentrate on these two tools, was seeing that there's the exam, the DP600, which is implementing analytic solution using Microsoft Fabric, had as part of the study guide, and I always check the study guide to make sure it hasn't changed, it had these requirements, design and build semantic models, identify use cases for DAC Studio and Tabular Editor 2. I underline Tabular Editor 2 because that is the free version. That is the version we will cover today. There is a paid version, but that is not part of the requirement. Another of the requirements is optimize enterprise scale semantic models. Improve DAX performance by using DAX Studio. Optimize a semantic model by using Tabular Editor 2. So let's say you were going to do the certification, you were going to study for it. I will, full disclosure, I have not taken the certification. In fact, I think it's good because I'm not here to tell you what the questions are, what questions I got. It's this is the study guide, this is what they want you to know, this is what I would concentrate or at least know. But more than that, that's a certification. That's something you would take. It may get your foot in the door. It may give you a promotion. But ultimately, why is my report slow? This should be our motivating factor. This is the thing that's going to outlive a certification. This can have a lasting impact, whether it's just on our developer skills or our crew development. And also, if you're the first person at your company to learn about these tools, then you can share them with your coworkers. So with the certification, I kind of think of this like Office 365. And this is going to be kind of an obvious example to us, but you have Office 365 and you have these different applications and you have different tasks that you have to do. So let's say you're given a set of tasks or you just know you have to do these tasks as part of your personal life. So for a novel, what app am I going to use? Well, that's going to be Word. For a budget, Excel. A term paper, Word. And then for your profit and loss, that's going to be Excel. And I know some of you love Excel so much that you would write your term paper, you would write a novel in Excel, I understand. But Word is probably the better choice for this answer. So same thing with these Power BI tools. I just break it down as, OK, I have this list of things that if I was given this as a question, what application, what external tool would I use? For a slow measure, I'm going to look at DAX Studio. Best Practice Analyzer? That's tabular editor. What if I need to test a DAX measure change? I'm kind of going between two measures to see which one's better. That's DAX Studio. Automate adding measures in C Sharp. That's tabular editor. And lastly, report timings. That really is performance analyzer. Again, some of these you could almost maybe argue like, well, that one you could maybe do with this. But these are the ones that if you asked me, these are how I would answer. So first thing we're going to look at is performance analyzer. And again, today we will go just a little bit where things get a little uncomfortable, a little complicated. 
And for probably the certification, you wouldn't have to go this far. But part of the reason I do it is to show that behind the curtain, there is a lot to Power BI and performance tuning. And for some people, that's going to be the thing that really attracts them to Power BI. So starting with Performance Analyzer, this is not an external tool. IT does not have to install this for you. It's built into Power BI Desktop. So if you go to Power BI Desktop and look at the ribbon and go to the Optimize, there's Performance Analyzer, and it's given the category under Review. So once I click on that, it opens this little extra basically tab and then you can you have some choices so i want to go ahead and start recording i'll click on that button recording is started i have kind of a couple of choices the most obvious is i want to click on that refresh visuals if i do that i'm going to refresh all the visuals on the page so i click on refresh visuals but I also have the choice of, okay, I actually don't want to refresh all the visuals on the page. I just want this one visual. I can click on this icon that's at the top right of the visual, and that will just refresh this visual. I do put a note that your timings, and we'll look at those, for the other category will be different if you just run it on this one visual. So there's no right answer, it just depends what numbers we're looking for. So once I click refresh visuals, in this case, I did it for everything on the page. So there's two cards in a table. If I go and expand that view, it shows those two cards in a table. And we have the total for the card, which is 65 milliseconds, so very fast. Three milliseconds for DAX query, three for visual, other is 59. That is, that is very fast. I would be happy with these numbers. So if I blow up that detail again, we see those numbers are very good. I even have some options to copy the query. I also have this option to run in DAX query view, something Michael spoke about. So we have three numbers. We have visual display, other and DAX query. So visual display, it's the time spent on producing that visual. So basically drawing the visual. If we go with a restaurant analogy, this is like plating the food. You could go to one restaurant and they just slop the food on the plate. You could go to another restaurant and they take their time and they put everything, they put the parsley in this and a little, little spread of this and just plate it perfectly, but it takes a lot longer to actually plate. That's how I think of this. So it's fun trying to create slow queries, slow visuals, and then also to create ones that aren't too slow for demos. So I created this one by basically making it so it's by the day and then put a lot of measures on this. Obviously, a visual person, someone who's speaking about the value of this, we would also question, is this visual even valuable to someone looking at it? But we're not concerned about that right now. We're concerned about this thing took almost 500 milliseconds to draw. So how do we solve that? We could reduce the complexity of the visual, maybe make it by month. Does it really need to be by date? If we're doing a lot of things where we're picking for each visual, we're picking the colors, we're putting backgrounds, we're doing all that, you may actually want to use a static background image. And since there is a lot of solutions and a lot of ways to handle this, I put links in the resources for this. Um, Data Mozart, Nicola, he's written a lot about this. So if this is the issue, you are going to want to read up more on how to fix it. 
And I will say if you change the granularity, let's say we go by month, you also may have to change that DAX code to match that granularity, depending on what you're actually looking for. So the one that's kind of funny, because it's just called other, that one actually is what took the longest for this. So that's 59 milliseconds. Other is basically the time waiting until that DAX query can be executed. So if we go at the restaurant analogy, that's the time waiting to order. There may be five other tables that the server has to go to first, get their orders until they come to us and we can actually place our order. So it's not the DAX query, it's not even drawing the visual. We're waiting to put in our order. So the other solutions is, one, you may have to reduce the number of visualizations on the page. If you have a thousand visualizations on the page, the rest are going to have to wait on those to finish. You may find that it's okay, let's say you have two visualizations or three. There may be a bottleneck with the first one. Maybe its DAX query is taking a long time. So then time it gets to this visualization, it's waited a long time. One quick way you can kind of do this is if you run it on that individual visualization, that usually will reduce the other time. So you can see, okay, if this one just runs, the other time is where the issue is. You also can move it to another page so it's by itself and run it and see the numbers. Again, this may be a combination of what other things are going on on the complete canvas. So lastly, we have the DAX query. Again, this one's three milliseconds. That's excellent. Wouldn't even try to do anything to make this faster. The DAX query is the time it takes to execute the DAX query. Because remember, under Power BI, under Analysis Services, Power Pivot, there are these set of engines that their job is to take a query and return a result or multiple results. So that's the time it takes those engines to return that result. So in a restaurant analogy, this is the time to actually prepare the food. I've ordered, sent my order in, and now it's time for the food to be prepared. Depending on how quickly they can make the food is how quickly I get back my food. So the slow DAX query, this one's almost 28 seconds. So this one's gonna be hard for someone to sit there and wait. If they're going to wait 28 seconds, this better save them money or allow them to make very important decisions for them to wait 28 seconds. So for the DAX query solutions, that's where things do get a little more complicated because we're dealing with DAX. We're dealing with kind of behind the curtain, underneath the covers. We can investigate that query. We can see where that query time is spent. And then we can start to say, OK, can this DAX query, this code, can it be optimized? Is there a way for us to rewrite it? This, again, is the part where things do get a little more complicated. And it may be that your job is to investigate it. And then there's the DAX expert that actually works on the DAX code. Or it may be that you start looking at this and going, whoa, I love this. This is, this is my jam. This is where I want to spend my time. So this is something Michael brought up. Um, probably need to remove the fact that DAX Query View was in preview. It's now generally available. But I do know some companies are still running older versions of Power BI Desktop. So it is general available, but up to May 2024, you had to go into options and you had to click preview to enable it. And then you also see that there's DAX query view with Copilot. 
again, this is for people running older versions. Maybe they're not allowed to upgrade or like I know one case where we're running an older version because of a bug. So that may apply that you have to come in here and turn on these preview features. So if I take and click that button and copy that query to DAX query view, you can see here it's basically my query. And then I have. All right, let me zoom in. The result said here. And depending on what this returns up here, there may be multiple results. And it does look a little weird if you're not used to seeing this because it has to return results that it can use for that visual completely. So it may have to include what the total is and other things. Because remember, it's going to take all this data behind the scenes and populate that visual. So query view, queries are saved with the model. Observe slow queries. Some people, and I think Michael touched on this, this is going to be their first exposure to DAX queries. Not allowed to install DAX Studio, maybe not even heard of DAX Studio. This is where you can start writing DAX. I love the use case he did because that is the perfect one that I need to see the top 10 rows of this table to see what the columns are, to see how I write my DAX. It also has other uses like validations. And I will throw out John Kursky is the one I always point out for anything with query view, validations, maybe even automating that. But it's not the best for diagnosing slow queries. Maybe it will be at one point, maybe they'll add on. But again, it's an excellent start. Kind of exciting news, they did announce, it's in preview, that there's query view for the web. So this is neat, because again, we're allowed to do stuff or we're able to do stuff in the browser. The only thing is you're using this against those models that are already up in your workspaces, up in your service. So that's one kind of limitation. If I have this Power BI desktop file open, and I'm working with it and I'm writing measures and stuff, I want to be able to work with it in that Power BI desktop file. So performance analyzer. I'm going to go ahead and open up a Power BI desktop file. So this is the one that I showed in the slide. So again, it's built into Power BI. You can go to Optimize, Performance Analyzer. I'm going to click on it. And again, I have to start recording for anything really to happen. And then this is that choice I have. I can come over to the visual and click on that little icon just for that visual. But I want to go ahead and run it for all of these. Those are about, what, 800 milliseconds for a lot of those. And then I can go ahead and do my breakdown. So if I do this one that I know is kind of slow, I see the DAX query on it is fast. It's that visual display that's 544 milliseconds. Not too bad, but again, I was trying to do things that were sort of fast for a demo. But the other is 249. So again, it's waiting for other visuals to populate and to run their queries. Now I can go ahead and run this in DAX query view. So I can pick any one of these and say, OK, run in DAX query view. And then I have two results. And again, this query, if I choose to keep it, will be saved with this desktop file. So if I'm trying to show someone else, 
or again, some people actually have queries in here that they'll use for validation. So the sales table should be this big or, you know, there's not exceptions. So performance analyzer is basically where we're usually going to start. It allows those informed decisions because if a visual is slow and I automatically think it's the DAX, I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole and spend all day wasting my time. So just because it's built into Power BI, don't underestimate this. This is the way we're gonna get that information from those visuals. And again, you don't want to waste your time if you actually can say and pinpoint right where that issue is. So sometimes when we deal with DAX, this is kind of how I feel. You're just like, please work, please work. Or you get this thing off the internet and you're like, please work. And we all know the whole DAX is easy but hard or DAX is easy but not simple. Part of DAX is learning the fundamentals. And so as we get into things that involve more DAX or performance tuning, it will pay off to actually learn the fundamentals and learn what's behind the choices we make. But again, some days I do feel like this when I'm dealing with DAX. So what about that slow query? This one's up to 60 seconds. So this one, if I leave it like this, this better have incredible value to someone to wait 60 seconds for that to refresh. And then as soon as they click on a slicer, how long do they have to wait for that? So now we have to turn to external tools. Not crazy about the name because I do think it almost turns people off to it. They're really companion tools. External does sound like it's it's something you're going and getting that may not be approved or may not be something that you should be allowed to use or we're gonna have to go pay for it. All the tools I cover today, we cover the free version. There are things that you find on the Microsoft support site. So the first thing is installation. So I go to the website, I download, download this tool. I recommend if you can, if you're allowed, do a full install. Because then in Power BI Desktop, it will add that little external tools tab icon in the external tools. So it makes it easy to run. So there's a list of the tools I've installed at this time. And that makes it easy for me to open them and connect directly to that model. It doesn't mean you have to run it this way. You also can open those tools and connect to models up in the service. So what about that slow DAX query? That's where we're gonna turn to DAX Studio first. So DAX Studio, you can download it from this website. I will provide a copy of this slide deck and put it on my GitHub and anywhere else that it's needed. So you don't have to copy everything down, but I wanted to know it is available here. This allows you to author the measures and queries. You can connect to semantic models in the service, in Fabric, analysis services. The main thing to know, especially if you're kind of like, what is this tool for? Think performance tuning. Think details about that query. Details we didn't get from DAX query view. So I have this DAX query that's very slow. I'm gonna go ahead and click that copy query button. That will copy it to clipboard. So then I have this Power BI desktop file open. I'm gonna go to external tools and go ahead and click the DAX studio icon. Then I'm gonna paste that query that I copied from Performance Analyzer in here. DAX Studio can be a little intimidating because there is a lot of icons on the ribbon, but just like anything else, you learn to use it as you need them. There's things that I even discover till later 
like one of my favorite things to point out now is the debug commas because we all want to comment something out because it's not working or we want to try it. Well, by clicking that button, it will put the comma in front of the line and it makes it easier to comment it out instead of going and either erasing the comma or you know moving the comma down, it does it for you because it knows how we debug stuff. So there's a lot to DAX Studio. To me, as a DBA, I use Management Studio on a daily basis. For Power BI and DAX, I use DAX Studio on a daily basis because this is how I interact with that semantic model. So if I go ahead and run this, we get those results just like query view. It even has the total, everything in here. But the, kind of the power and the thing where we're really concentrating on today is these traces that are up here. This is kind of where the power is and DAX Studio had this really early. And so that's why a lot of people used it early on. So the first one is all queries. Coming from SQL Server, this is like profiler. I know they want us to use extended events, but we're all still using SQL Server profile. Just don't tell anyone. This is where you click on this and this will capture all those queries that are going on. Those are being requested of the server. Hey, I need you to do this. I need you to run this, evaluate this. And you can sit there and run that. It can be helpful if you're trying to capture a query that maybe someone else is running, but for the most part, you may already have that query copied like we did earlier. In that case, one of the first options is query plan. So query plans, there's two types. There's a logical and a physical. And it looks like this. The problem is with SQL Server, we have visual tools that allow you to visualize the query plan. So when you first see this, I kind of want to uh, borrow a line from Patrick from Guy in the Cube, but the French toast. Now I'm probably going to get like a cease and desist and he's going to send, you know, trademark infringement. But seriously, this is a lot and this may turn people off. But remember, we have other tools. We're going to cover the other server timings. For the most part, if you want to go down this rabbit hole, if you really need this, then that's something you're going to get like the optimizing DAX book or the videos and really go in depth. I will add the first thing that I've started to use from this is looking at that number of records returned. If this is a million records, and I'm only expecting 100, then I'm going to wonder why did it materialize all those records when it's only going to return 100? In this case, it's only 119. Again, don't think on the certification you're going to be given this and have to answer anything, but that's just me. So this is the, the gold here, the server timings. So we do have to stop and realize Power BI Analysis services, Power Pivot, there's two engines underneath that are working to try to answer your queries. There's the formula engine and the storage engine. The formula engine, it's basically like the conductor. I realize I've been using a restaurant analogy and I probably should come up with something that's more restaurant like, but I also like the conductor analogy. So the formula engine, it's not going to cache. It's single threaded, but it's able to do the complex operations. We'll pause here for a second because we're about to talk about the storage engine. And this one gets a little confusing for some people because we talk about the storage engine. We're not referring to when you use import mode Vertipack, we're not talking about loading that data when processing the model. So when that comes up, we talk about query folding and does this query fold? What's the native query? We're talking about 
after, if we are using import mode, after that data has been pulled from the source and stored in the storage engine and actually processed and split up into columns and all the optimizations that go on. So we're not talking about when you refresh daily, hourly. We're talking about that data has been refreshed. It is now in that storage engine. In this case, and for the most part, when we start, the best place to start is import mode, VertiPack. That's what you really should be using unless you have a case where you cannot use VertiPack. You know, you need a little bit of data that's more up to date, but VertiPack and import mode should be where you go first. So all of this is stored, and then we are going to query that on the fly. Every time we look at a visual, every time we apply a slicer, we're querying that data. If it's in import mode, VertiPack, that's probably going to be quicker. If we're in direct query, it's going out to a SQL server or Snowflake or something else. So I just wanted to point that out because I know that's been a little confusion of, oh, are we talking query folding and refresh? So the storage engine, this is where we really want most of that query time to be spent because it has the ability to cache the data ability to be multi-threaded, but the type of operations available depends on the storage engine. So if we're using import mode and VertiPack, those operations are very limited. It's going to have to ask the formula engine to do things. But that is what the VertiPack engine is for. It is made to be quick. So this is not a thing of, well, it's limited, so I'm going to use direct query, because then you're not talking about using something that is optimized for returning that data. And on that note, some of the things we'll cover just a little um, direct query and the different types of storage engines. But that starts to really get out of the scope of this presentation because now we're talking about how do you performance tune direct query? You know, how do you, okay, it's SQL Server. Now you have to get DBAs involved and there's indexes and everything else. So the storage engine, there's different ones underneath. So again, we have the VertiPack import and then direct query SQL. SQL Server, Snowflake, or a combination of these. Like you have a couple tables that are import, stored locally as I would call it, and then the rest, it's going direct query out to a SQL Server. Or you have direct query using another tabular server. Again, a lot of this is a little bit more than we really need to cover today. But one thing you should know is if you make the switch and you say, we're not going to use import mode, we're not going to use VertiPack, we're going to use direct query, then it's up to you to figure out and to performance tune and test what those consequences are going to be. So an example is that I've seen is only the date table is import. Every other table is direct query. So what is the performance impact of that? Because now it has to take that date table and send all those dates to that direct query to Snowflake, to SQL Server. So again, it's going to be up to you as you get into these more complicated situations. Life would be beautiful if we could all just stay in VertiPack. So the storage capability, the storage engine capability of VertiPack, it needs the formula engine for something as simple as, as an if statement. SQL Server can actually push this equivalent, but this is an argument to use SQL Server over VertiPack. Just know VertiPack was built for a certain purpose, and then when it needs more complicated 
operations, it's going to go to the formula engine. So VertiPack is column based, not row based. It uses encoding to again reduce that size and then compresses it. So again, even though we view a semantic model of tables and relationships, that's a human view for us. Underneath that data is stored in columns and coded. If you only have yes, no, and it can sort it correctly, that data may be compressed a tenth of what the the original data is, a hundredth of what the original data is. It really just depends on how you built your model. So again, going to the restaurant analogy, VertiPack, it's like a storeroom that's local that you can run in there. It's organized, you know where everything is, and get out what you need. Direct query, it's like a restaurant where you need a supplier to bring what I request every time you need it. Now, maybe that supplier offers some things that are already pre-made that do allow you to save time on that, but you still have to wait for that item to reach you. So we're back in DAC Studio. One thing I want to point out is, remember, I talked about the storage engine being able to cache. So in DAC Studio, it gives us the option to clear the cache on demand anytime we want. Or a lot of times I'll use the one to clear on run because every time I run it, I want it to clear the cache. Again, it depends if you're trying to do something where you're testing something with cache, then you would not want to clear it. So in DAC Studio, down towards the bottom, you see the server timings and query plan because I've hit the button on each one of those and now it shows them to me. So one of the simplest DAX query we can do is just evaluate a table. Now, if it's a big table, then it would be better to do the top in and actually only return, you know, 10 rows or 100 rows. But I want to show you when you return just this simple query and you go to DAX Studio, you can see kind of what looks like SQL but we're dealing with import mode, VertiPack. We're not dealing with the SQL server. So technically this is kind of a human readable form of what looks like SQL. Behind the scenes, it may not actually run something like this. This is called XM SQL. And one thing I point out is you notice that it added a row number to this query. And that's because if it doesn't have that row number, it's going to try to aggregate this query. So if I'm only looking for a brand and color, it will try to aggregate that and reduce the number of rows returned. By putting a row number, it will now return every row, which is what we want when we say, give me the product table. So this is where things get really interesting. Again, if you're doing the certification, are you going to have to do this, answer these questions? Probably not. But what do we know? DAX Studio. DAX Studio is performance tuning. It allows us to see the performance. It allows us to see what's going on behind the scenes. That's the important part. So on this query, we have this little timeline, and it shows this one is mainly in the formula engine. And blue shows where that storage engine comes into play. And we see those queries to the right that it's actually running at that time. This one is 33.3% in the formula engine. And then we see how blue kind of comes in, but it takes a lot longer to finish some of those storage engine queries. So these server timings up here or over here, this is probably one of the most valuable pieces. So you have these server timings. You have the total time in milliseconds of this query. You have the storage engine CPU. And then you have whether or not it was executed in parallel that query. So this one was able to do a 1.7 times. 
So that CPU may take a lot longer, but the fact it was able to do it in parallel means that total time actually is less than what that storage engine CPU is because it went parallel. We have the Ford formula engine in yellow. That was five milliseconds. The storage engine in blue. And then this timeline bar is very neat because you see where each engine comes into play. One of my favorite things is the storage engine queries. This is the thing that sometimes you can go from 100 storage engine queries down to just a couple with a certain optimization and DAC. And then this shows whether it was able to hit the storage engine cache. Again, I'm refreshing, but I'm clearing the cache each time. Um, but you know, you have to remember in Power BI, if multiple things are hitting that cache, that's actually a benefit. So the simplest way to increase query time is this pattern that I have a calculate and instead of filtering by a column, I'm applying and creating a filter for the whole sales table and applying that as a filter. A lot of us know this is actually a very common pattern. It's something that I think we kind of do because we started out with filter and that's how we use filter. And then we went to calculate, we started using it this way. And we'll actually touch on this a little bit later too. So when I do that pattern, all of a sudden my storage engine queries went to almost 2,600 for that query. Also, the total time is up in 84 milliseconds. So, eight, I mean, 84 seconds. One thing I will say, the data set size matters. So if you're doing things on 10,000 rows, 200 rows, things are going to be quick. It covers a lot of sins. You start doing a million rows, 10 million, 100 million, that's where you're really going to start getting those high numbers. So this server timing is much better. We barely have any storage engine queries. It's a quick query. So this one, you can see it's heavily in the formula engine. And the only reason that matters is we know the formula engine cannot go parallel. It's single threaded. It cannot cache, but it can do a lot. It can do the complicated operations. We just want to see, can we get more of that in the storage engine, let it go parallel, and only use the formula engine when it really absolutely needs it. So the way to invoke the formula engine, if you're trying to do testing, you just want to see it, is things a storage engine can't do if you're using Vertipak. Things like if statements, concatenate. Again, this is not saying reduce these, don't use these in your patterns. I'm just saying as soon as you have these, it's going to have to take a little bit of formula engine. You'll also notice this thing called a callback data ID. And this basically is just a pointer so the formula engine and storage engine can work together. So instead of the storage engine having to do everything and then go back to the formula engine, this is their way of kind of working together. So it's action optimization. So one thing I want to point out about direct query model is what we just covered. You can see, like I showed you, those storage engine queries and how many. So if I'm using direct query against something that I'm paying for, like let's say a snowflake or something where I'm paying for every query, then how many queries are being sent to the source? If I have 600 going to the source and I can reduce that to two, that could be a cost savings. It also could be a speed savings. I already have that Power BI file open.
I'm going to go to one of these bad queries. Again, it's funny because I had one, you know, we saw that took 60, 80 seconds. And it's like, well, I can't use that one because then everyone's going to be waiting 60 or 80 seconds. So it's like finding that balance. So I'm going to go ahead and start recording of the performance analyzer here. I've already cleared it, stopped it. And I'm going to refresh just this one visual. Probably the fact that I name my uh, measure big orders bad probably is not really giving it hope that it's going to be fast. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that query. And then again, I've already installed DAC Studio. I've already installed Tabular Editor. So I'm going to go ahead and run it from here. That allows it to connect directly back to this data model without me having to pick it. Move it over. So it's in the clipboard, so I'm going to go ahead and paste it, make it a little bigger here. And what is nice is if this is the environment you're working in and you're working on queries, you have your tables, your columns, everything over here. It's a very nice environment to work in. Especially if you come from Visual Studio trying to do analysis services and little tiny grids, it was just crazy. So I'm going to go ahead and run this query. I'm going to turn on the server timings. And I'm going to run them. I'm going to run them again because, whoa, they seem very faster than I would have thought. If I look here, I'm hitting that storage engine cache each time. That's kind of a reminder like, oh, OK, I actually do want to come up here and clear on run. So when I run it again, I'm not hitting that storage engine cache. I want it from cold cache, nothing in there. Oh, there it goes. Again, you may want to test against having that in cache. So as you can see, this is about what? 120 storage engine queries. Right away, this should be like, whoa, why is it doing all these queries? And they all have dates in the where. It's almost like it's pushing those dates. Again, that query is not fast. So I am going to want to optimize the total query time, but also the storage engine queries. So one thing is in DAC Studio, you can come in here and say, OK, I got this total big orders bad. That's this measure. I'm going to go ahead and define that in my query. And I can make changes that. And it's basically I'm making changes locally. I don't have to have access to the server wherever this may have been deployed. I'm running it here. I can make changes and say, OK, let's say I know I just read a blog post. And I know that that pattern I was doing was bad. And I can't spell. I'm going to go ahead and change this and try it again with this change and see if it makes a difference. And it's like, OK, this one little change dropped it down to 104 milliseconds. And the biggest thing is I now only have one storage engine query being sent. So that pattern of filtering by a whole table had a big difference behind the scenes of how many queries it was generating. And think about that. If you're writing that pattern and you are using direct query, and that's going out to maybe a service that you're paying per query, that can get costly. More importantly, we're using VertiPack import. It also is the speed of the query. There is a lot you can do with DAX Studio. I really love the fact that you can define measures. You can define the dependent measures. But this is where I would go to actually test out a measure and actually work on developing things. And as you can see, I mean, with time, we have to kind of cover a little bit of each tool. And like I said, knowing that we have that study guide in mind and just knowing what we want to get out of each tool, 
I think this is a good kind of compromise. So what about taking proactive measures? Like how do we find that pattern that I just mentioned ahead of time? Or what if we have 100 models or 10 models that we just inherited? How are we going to even see if those models have issues? That is where tabular editor comes in. So tabular editor, its main use that I used it for is to develop the model, create things, create tables, columns, make changes. The way it was originally created was the person who developed it, Daniel, had to create or not create. He had to take 600 measures and move them all into a folder for a client. That meant he would have to click, change, click, change, click. Instead, knowing for analysis services, there's a little JSON file in the background. He created an editor that would just edit that file and allowed him with C Sharp to script out that change. And I think was done like in an hour, definitely by the end of the day, and then took the rest of the week to actually develop that application. That change would have took him a week, and that client would have had to wait a week for him to make that change manually. You also can audit the model, and this is where we come in today with best practice analyzer. Again, there is a lot to tabular editor, but this is the part we're going to kind of drill down on today. So tabular editor 2.x, you can download. It's free. Here's the link to GitHub. Something that I always forget to mention is Tabular Editor has wonderful free training, has wonderful blog posts, especially if like Kurt does a blog there. They have great training, not only on their tool, but just semantic modeling and best practices and stuff that's not even about the tool itself. So again, it's free. This is the version listed in DP600. You are not required to buy or use the one that costs money. Tabular Editor 3 is the one that's paid. It does have extra features, so it has things like a DAX debugger. And then where I've started using it a lot lately is to script out DAX. So if you have 10 measures in a model, you can script them out and then move them to another model really easily. Again. Tabular Editor 2 is what the certification is. It's the thing you can download and start using today. So as soon as we see anything about optimizing a semantic model, Tabular Editor 2, even if it just optimize a semantic model, forget the Tabular Editor 2, that's best practice analyzer. This analyzer, and I will admit, Tabular Editor 2 is not the best as far as scaling and UI and for screenshots. But uh, so under tools, you'll see best practice analyzer and then to manage those BPA rules. So to add and manage rules, they're basically just a JSON file. So you could make the file from scratch and point. Oh, hold on one second. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. All right, so you can basically create that file yourself and add and manage those rules of the file you created. But remember, we're about saving time, simplification. You can actually download a C Sharp script to run in Tabular Editor, and you can look on it as far as where the, uh, the source is. It's coming from Microsoft's GitHub. And again, this is on Tabular Editor's site. It's on a lot of the resources I put in the back. But you can use this to download that rule file. And it actually has a thing for it will download into a different path for version three than two. It also has where you can substitute out the languages. So if you want Italian, Japanese, Spanish, you can substitute them out. And this is a quick way to get that rule file. But you may be like, nope, not running this script, not gonna do it. 
so I mean, all you have to do is go to one of the options is the Microsoft GitHub, download it there. Also on that GitHub is going to have a lot more information, a lot more detail, the different locations, if you want it per user, per machine. Same thing with the Tabular Editor website. So there is a lot of resources out there. So what's neat about Best Practice Analyzer is it will tell on your model right away. At the bottom, it will be, hey, I found this many issues. There's 126. Again, these are issues, but these are things that are in that rule file and you can take out ones you don't agree with, ones you don't wanna check. But with this current rule file, it found 126. So I can go and look and say, okay, what did it find? In this case, it was 123. And then I can see the type, the severity, even the category, is that performance or is that just maintenance? That, you know, we really care more about the performance or may we care more about the maintenance. So you can go and manage those rules. So what about that slow pattern that we showed where we had that query that sent all the storage engine queries and took forever? How do we prevent that? How do we find out if that's even in our environment? It's this one. This one, we're filtering by the whole table. I'm filtering by sales. Up until today, I may not even have known this is an issue. And now I do, and I want to find out, are we doing this? So there is a rule in Tabular Editor in those best practice rules that I downloaded that is filter measure values by columns, not tables. Well, that's fine, but I don't really know if that's true. I don't know if that's best practice. Well, if you go and edit this rule, under the description will be references and it will be examples. So if I go look at that, there's actually, this is the one from the current rule set that tells me instead of doing this, here's some options, here's two references, one's Microsoft, one's SQL BI. One of the other links I found actually went to uh, Michael Kowalski's Elegant BI website. He's very heavily involved in best practice analyzer. And he has 10 best practices and 10 mistakes people make. And again, showing you here, this is the different options. And if you go to that blog post, he will show you the difference because technically these aren't equivalent. So it really is, what do you mean by this? What are you trying to accomplish? You can change that description. It's a JSON file. You can link to your company's best practices. You could have SharePoint where you have what you want written. Opening Tabular Editor. So again, I'm doing it from this external tools so that I'm doing that direct connect back to the model. And like I told you right away, it's like, whoa, we got 122 issues here. So I can click on that. I can also drag this over. So here's those issues. I can go ahead and collapse them all. And again, that one, again, there's lots of problems here. But the filter column with proper syntax, there's that total big orders bad that we looked at earlier. That right away tells you, okay, and again, I can, once I look through those, I can also come back, say, okay, I wanna manage my rules. I use that C Sharp script, so it downloaded it for the local user. And I can come in here, and like I said, we can actually edit that rule. We could change it. Maybe for our company, we want a certain verbiage. We want to put a link in here. But here's that more info actually telling me what is the issue. 
for most of these, they're just regular expressions that are basically pattern matching, and that's it, how they're able to detect things. Another thing is, if we have something where, so let's look at one of these issues where it's a floating point data type. That's something that can be changed in the model. I can actually right click on it and generate a fixed script or apply that script right outright. So if I do generate a fixed script, it copied it to the clipboard. I go up here to C sharp script and I paste it in. And there it is. If I run that script, it's able to change that data type to decimal. There are lots of scripts out there. Um, there's ones where you can take the columns and hide them and make a sum on top of each one and put them all in a folder. There is a lot with the scripts. If you're having to automate and do a lot of changes to your model, it's well worth looking at the resources at the back of the slide deck and actually seeing how much you can do with scripting. Again, today, the main thing is the fact that if you did have to identify something that Tabular Editor is going to do, it's that best practice analyzer, the auditing the model, figuring out issues with my model. And again, I'm doing this on one Power BI desktop file. But remember, I can open that up and connect to different models up in the service and check each one and be like, well, this one has 100. Oh, this one has 200. OK. And maybe for your company, you reduce that down and say, OK, we're going to check for these five things. Or as we build the model, we're going to check for these things and see if we have issues. I would say we're landing the plane, but that really doesn't go with the whole smoker analogy. So I guess the brisket's almost ready. So in conclusion, you have a slow report, whether it's you noticing a user, where do you start? Normally you're gonna start in Power BI Desktop because with Performance Analyzer, you can actually see, okay, what is going on on this page and where is the issue that I need to fix? Then we may, if it's with a DAX query, we may copy that out to DAX Studio and actually run that and look at that and look at those server timings. But what about prevention? That's where Tabular Editor is going to come in with Best Practice Analyzer. That's where it's able to tell you this is the issue that this model has based on, again, these rule sets. And I say that a lot because it really depends on what you agree is best practice. So the takeaway today is basically the time invested in these tools, I think goes beyond the certification. I think the certification is excellent. I think that's going to be my goal for this year. But once I pass that certification, hopefully it's more about having other skills and having things that I'm able to apply, things that we're able to teach our coworkers. We're able to take, and we have even got into some of the tabulator things, like I mentioned the scripting, instead of having someone take a whole day to sit there and make changes manually, the fact that a script could maybe do it in a minute. And this can only enhance your skill set. I will tell you the more and more time goes on, the more I see that all people think of as Power BI is a visual, Power BI is visuals, that's all it is. They don't know there's engines behind there. They don't know there's multiple formula and storage. So the more you know, especially if you're maybe going for a job and you're sitting next to someone who only knows Power BI desktop and even doesn't understand the model and why things are slow, it's going to enhance you. It's going to make you better, more productive.
And again, I love Power BI Desktop, and I think Dax Query View just shows they keep putting more into it, but it can only do so much. We need some of these other tools. Like I said, I have a bunch of resources here. I tried to put as many as possible. Um, like I said, Tabular Editor has great free training. Forget whether or not use the tool, just some of their blog posts, some of their training on the semantic model are just wonderful. Um, obviously love any data goblins, Kurt thing, data Mozart. Again, he's the one I would go to or start with for visual speed. If you are just in love with the query plan and storage engine queries and all that, the optimizing DAX book is like a brick, but it is amazing. And again, I will put these slide decks on my GitHub. Um, I did use the smoker icon from a website. Are there any questions? If you say you couldn't hear me the whole time, I'm going to die inside. No, we could hear you, Jason. That's a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Any well, other questions from anybody else? Jason, I just want to say uh, how much I appreciate uh, seeing this. Uh, I, was, I feel like I'm ready to take the DP600 today. So uh, definitely got <laughs> yeah. to. That needs to be my goal too. Uh, um, you know, to, to, take, to take that exam. Uh, so I, I heard there, it can be a tough exam. So I, I uh, appreciate all the all the preparation we, we can get. So uh, let me uh, bring up my screen really quickly here. Um, to no other questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we, should, we want to thank uh, Jason Romans for his great presentation on uh, DAX Studio and Tad Editor. This has been a really uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, we do have our um, our talk for uh, November uh, scheduled. So this is the, the one week before Thanksgiving, Thursday, November 21st. This is a uh, real-time streaming analytics and fabric with Christina Ferris. That should also be a really uh, fascinating talk as well. We do have uh, uh, openings for September and October. So if you have a, 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 a talk uh, inside of you that you've been wanting to get out, you've been wanting to, to practice, tell everybody about, uh, give us a shout. We'd love to uh, to talk to you about that. So I know we're uh, a few minutes over time, so we're going to go ahead and uh, let everybody go. Thanks for sticking around, and uh, thanks again, Jason, for a, a great presentation. Thank you. I appreciate it.